Hello everyone. Thank you for joining in. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to all the viewers today. Uh, so my name is Ankit Sahu. Uh, I'm the co-founder and director of Objective Hair Technologies. So with me today, Mr. Sangha Subra Deb, uh, Mr. Brigu Ahuja, who will be presenting for the for today's webinar, and Mr. Ashi Jacob. Uh, with Mr. Rahul Pise, he will be we will be working in the background uh, for helping you answer all the questions uh, all, on, in the ongoing webinar itself. And uh, we had a quite a run uh, till now since the lockdown for COVID-19 started. We this this will be our 22nd webinar we have been conducting uh, since April uh, this year and it has been quite a good audience we have got we have got very interesting questions very interesting views from our panelists so today we have invited a few a few of the academicians uh, and few people who have worked on the material themselves and who had got their hands dirty with the additive technology itself and also we have uh, mr dilip uh, who is the managing director of 3d systems in india and uh, he will be focusing more on how a machine manufacturers look at uh, applications and materials. So, so today's webinar will be conducted by um, Mr. Brigo Auja. Previously, we did in the same series uh, in the month of July itself, we have done how to be an informed AM buyer. We also did on pre and the post AM, uh, enabling the design quality and the traceability. So it, it has been quite a journey uh, through these webinars and we have we were able to motivate i think uh, a lot of uh, new users in the field and um, we might have been able to solve some of your questions and the queries but uh, nothing as you dig deeper your your curiosity for any any technology or any topic increases as as much so so with those thoughts we are doing a webinar today on a materials for the characterization development and the testing so, Brigu, you can initiate. Yeah. Um, thank you, Ankit. Yes. Um, welcome, everybody, to the Admix Advanced Manufacturing webinar. Today, we'll be focusing on additive manufacturing materials. This is the third webinar in the series. Um, I would like to begin with. Um, so just an introduction to what we've done previously. The last webinar that we had was focused on the pre and post additive manufacturing. Um, we discussed about various technologies, data processing, data management, um, various post processing techniques like tipping, key treatment, machining, and all this was focused towards making sure that the uh, specification of the part is delivered as it's supposed to be. We had panelists last time, uh, Dr. Uh, Deepa Srinivasan, Jingjie Yuan, Kelvin B, uh, and our founder of Objectify, Mr. Ankit Sahu, was conducting the webinar. Um, I would firstly like to introduce uh, the panelists for today. Firstly, Dilip Menezes. Uh, Dilip is an entrepreneur for 23 years with experience in building and running additive manufacturing related technology companies, two of which were acquired by 3D Systems in 2011. Subsequently, he created and headed the subsidiary in India, built engineering software and hardware teams, expanded the 3D printer and 3D software sales channels built a service team to grow sales, enhance customer experience, and strengthen customer confidence. Please welcome Dilip Menes, the Managing Director of 3D Systems. Our second panelist for today, Professor Dipankar Banerjee. Um, Dr. Banerjee graduated from IIT Madras and obtained his PhD from the Indian Institute of Science. His early research career involved understanding structure property relationships in titanium alloys using advanced techniques of electron microscopy, 
and subsequently the development of intermetallics based on the titanium aluminium system for use in high temperature application. He has held esteemed positions like the director of GRD, DMRL and the chief controller research and development of GRDO. Dr. Banerjee is a fellow of All India Science Academics and the Indian National Academy of Engineering. He has been recognized as a distinguished alumnus of the Indian Institute of Technology, Chennai, and Indian Institute of Science. He has been awarded with the Shanti Swaru Patnaga Prize in the field of engineering science, DRDO Lifetime Achievement Award, and Padma Shri. Please welcome Dr. Dipankar Banerjee. Our third panelist for today, Dr. Kumar Kandasamy. He's a Dr. Kumar Kandasamy metallurgist, welding engineer, inventor, and technology developer with an experience in end to end additive manufacturing value chain. Dr. Kandasamy provides technical and scientific consultancy in the area of materials and manufacturing processes and develops newer technologies to advance current cutting edge technologies through his startup enabled engineering. He has the experience in transforming and additive manufacturing technology to commercialization at Aeropro Corporation and was involved in establishing additive manufacturing business unit from ground up at Olicon AM. Please welcome Dr. Kumar Kandasani. Uh, myself, uh, Bhrigu Ahuja, I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Objectify Technologies and um, I'll be moderating and conducting the webinar for today. I welcome you all and we'll begin the uh, presentation, a small presentation, after which we'll have a discussion with our panelists and uh, we'll welcome audience question thereon. Um, so, starting off the uh, webinar, AM materials, characterization, development, and testing. Um, just a brief introduction to the contents of the webinar today. We'll be discussing about uh, the material processing mechanisms, uh, especially with relation to stereolithography, selective laser sintering, and direct metal laser sintering, also known as laser-based powder bed fusion. Uh, on the polymer side, we'll further discuss in detail the stereolithography and the selective laser sintering technologies. On the metal side, we'll be looking at the direct metal laser sintering or the laser-based powder bed fusion. We'll have a brief understanding of the new material development process and finally end with characterization of additive manufacturing materials and overview of the metal additive manufacturing processes. Um, starting with the material processing mechanisms, um, here we've briefly compared some of the few uh, most prominent uh, additive manufacturing processes, starting with the first three, which are more focused towards polymer additive manufacturing, fused deposition modeling, um, a technology which is the most widely used process at the moment. It is basically focusing on the fusion of extruded thermoplastic. The hot thermoplastic extrusion is fused and formed into a 3D structure by selective deposition from a hot extrusion nozzle. Um, another polymer-based additive manufacturing process, stereolithography, abbreviated as SLA, stereolithography apparatus. It is based on the concept of photopolymerization, where a monomer, which is in the form of a resin, is converted into a 3D structure, solid polymer, by selective curing using a UV laser as a catalyst. The third process, selective laser sintering, which is based on the physical process of solid state sintering, where 
particle boundary fusion takes place and sintered structures are formed. This process primarily uses a CO2 laser. The powder bed is um, heated using infrared um, heaters inside the chamber and the laser provides the additional energy to enable solid state sintering and boundary layer fusion in the particles. The laser based powder bed fusion is focused towards the melting and resolidification. This is primarily used with metallic powders and the background of this process can be related to a laser welding process and uh, can be termed as a micro welding process in certain cases. A high intensity laser uh, heats up the powder bed and forms a melt pool, consequently selectively melting and resolidifying a 3D structure. Um, the laser is a solid state laser and it enables the complete melting of the powder, unlike selective laser sintering, where only the solid state sintering takes place. In this case, the complete melting takes place and the absorption of the laser energy. Direct energy deposition is a process very similar to the laser-based powder bed fusion, but the powder is not in a powder bed in this case, but is injected through a nozzle. And similarly, a milk pool is formed on the substrate in which the powder is injected to form a 3D structure. There is an in injection of powder in the milk pool and the energy is absorbed, forming a solid 3D structure. Both the laser-based powder bed fusion and the direct energy deposition can be related to the welding processes, which we are very familiar with. I'd like to quickly discuss some of the polymer additive manufacturing materials. Um, uh, the focus is on the stereolithography and the selective laser sintering materials. We've tried to classify the materials and given the grades of materials, I would like to point out that there are many more materials which we've not included in the list at the moment. Um, but if we were to uh, define the applications like visual prototypes, uh, transparency, which is um, possible in stereolithography paths, high deflection temperature resins, uh, high strength resins, uh, biocompatible, which are used for medical applications, composites, which can be ceramic uh, reinforced resins like teak and bluestone, and special resins, which are focused on creating masters for investment casting application. Um, these are polycarbonate like resins and um, are used for creating 3D patterns for investment casting. Similarly, within the selective laser sintering, we have uh, materials which are based on nylon 12, nylon 11, polypropylene. These are primarily, primarily used for functional testing application. If you were to look at high strength application, glass fill nylon is a material type, which uh, also includes nylon 11 and PP for high strength application. Special flame retardant nylon 12s are available for applications of flame retardancy. Highly elastic flexible uh, thermoplastic elastomers are also available. Within um, SLS food grade materials and polystyrene based materials for investment casting patterns uh, are available. And most of the materials, the nylon 12 and the peak based materials are biocompatible for medical applications. Going on next, um, I've just given examples of some of the polymer applications. The first example we see is of a patient specific guide, which is formed using selective laser sintering. In this case, the data would be uh, created using the CT or MRI scan of the patient and 
specific guides, surgical guides would be created using selective laser sintering. The second example is of a master, which is created using selective laser sintering for investment casting. This is a lost wax pattern where the material um, gets fully burnt in the process, not leaving any residue or leaving minimum residue. We have selective laser centered models of um, engine manifolds. Some examples of stereolithography, transparent parts, and again, medical models which are formed using stereolithography. A concept uh, that we've seen in the aerospace being formed with the aerospace interiors using polymer additive manufacturing for uh, cabin components uh, is currently being uh, discussed. So looking at some of the developments in polymer material for additive manufacturing. Firstly, some of the primary material suppliers tend to be the system technology OEMs. These would be the uh, major companies like EOS, 3D Systems and other machine manufacturers. Within the FTM, we find some independent material suppliers being available. Some of the major material producers for SLA include GSM SOMOS, for SLS Evonik. The material concept for stereolithography is primarily a photocurable polyurethane, which is converted into a solid structure by using UV light as a catalyst. In the case of selective laser sintering, the material is produced by cryogenic binding in a ball mill. Some of the new players that we see in the domain of polymer materials include BASF. Uh, we've seen a lot of activity on the polymer side, but there seems to be some challenges for new polymer developers to come in. Um, some of these are that the big chemical companies for the material manufacturers still, still regard additive manufacturing industry with a very low market size. The market is also dominated by system technology OEMs, even for material sales. And there are obvious technical challenges um, uh, which uh, prevent the introduction of new players in the technology. Coming to some of the metal additive manufacturing materials, um, here we have material properties and applications. Um, so the one of the primary application areas of tooling requires materials with high wear resistance. And for this, uh, we have typical miraging steel and tool steels. 1.2709 miraging steel and H13 tool steel are processable using laser-based powder bed fusion. Um, medical and dental industry needing biocompatible materials, the options of titanium, cobalt chrome, and selective laser uh, and stainless steel alloys. These would be SS316L, commercially pure titanium or titanium 6 aluminum 4 vanadium and cobalt chrome. High temperature applications in the aerospace and energy industry um, have the option of titanium nickel super alloys and cobalt chrome materials. High strength to weight ratio typical titanium alloys are available. For die casting prototypes, castable aluminum silicon alloys, typically ALSI 10NG is used in the industry. For sheet metal prototypes, steel alloys such as the 1.2709 and stainless steel 316L are being used. High strength steel, uh, which have precipitation hardened steels, typically stainless steel 17.4 pH and stainless steel 15.5 pH. For high electrical conductivity, there has been an introduction of copper alloys. These include pure copper and copper chromium zirconium. And for corrosion resistant, we have corrosion resistant stainless steel alloys. These are some of the applications that we've come across uh, within our experience. Um, of course, the metal additive industry is moving at a very, very fast rate, and there's always new applications and industries being formed. Um, coming to metal powders for uh, direct metal laser centering or a laser based powder bed fusion. Firstly, if we look at the material characteristics, 
we look at characteristics that would include good weldability and castability. There is a there should be a low susceptibility to hot cracking uh, for the materials. And typically our laser powder bed based laser systems have a wavelength of uh, 1070 nanometer or near about there. So ideally materials with a high absorption in that wavelength um, would be good to work with. Typical powder characteristics include good flowability and packing density. We look for powders which have a spherical morphology and a typical granulometry uh, would range between 20 and 63 microns, although we also find uh, particles which are ranging from 15 to 45 or 10 to 45. Ideally, there should be a mixture of large and small particles in order to enable a good packing density. So as a fully dense 3D structures can be formed, the chemical composition should comply with the standard of the material. So typically pre-alloyed powders are used with the same chemical composition and a low oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen content is regarded as a very positive aspect. The production methodology typically is atomization for very good spherical particles. Typically, inert gas atomization is used, but this process is also expensive. So there is new research going on around particles that have been manufactured by air atomization or water atomization which could be relatively cheaper to produce. This is a part of ongoing research and in certain cases, water atomized particles might be used. Um, the recyclability of the material is more or less complete from the powder bed. Uh, apart from the fact that the powders need to be sealed and any support structure or large agglomerates of powders are removed. Typically, with whatever studies have been done in a standard environment where powders would be regularly used and new powder would be mixed, there isn't a strong evidence of significant degradation with regular use and demixing of the powder. Um, on the slide on the picture on top, I show the morphology of a typical titanium 6 aluminum 4 vanadium particle on the left, which is a very, very spherical particle and ALSI 10 mg, which is slightly unspherical potato shape, but still it has got good flowability characteristics. At the bottom, there is a graph indicating the particle size distribution. Uh, the typical D50 is uh, around 32 microns, which would be the range where good flowability is obtained. Um, and also the D10 and D90 are important characteristics. On the right, the schematic of uh, inert gas atomization unit is shown. Um, next, I would like to discuss titanium processing in additive manufacturing. We would rate the technology readiness level as nine for titanium in additive manufacturing. So as to say that it has been proven in operational environment. The typical alloys are commercially pure titanium and titanium 6 aluminum 4 vanadium. The additive manufacturing processes that are able to process are laser-based powder bed fusion, electron beam powder bed fusion, and binder jet technology. On the um, picture at the bottom, on the right-hand side, we see a comparison between the mechanical characteristics of the laser-based powder bed fusion, electron beam powder bed fusion, and the binder jet technology with regards to the ASTM standard. Uh, we see that the laser-based powder bed fusion and the electron beam powder bed fusion both have higher ultimate tensile strength in comparison, both have higher yield strength in comparison to the ASTM standard. The binder jet technology have a lower yield strength, but the ultimate tensile strength, all the three processes qualify with regards to the ASTM standard. From an elongation perspective, in an as-built condition, the 
uh, elongation of a laser based powder bed fusion is low. This um, also means that we need to have a focus on the post processing technologies. So the processing challenges which typically result in the lower elongation are related to the very high cooling rates and a very high thermal residual stress and a very, very fine microstructure in the as-built condition. We can find a structural uh, characteristics with relative density greater than 99.5% uh, with laser-based powder bed fusion and a very fine laminar microstructure. The mechanical characteristics are better than conventional casted alloys for static tensile strength. However, the fatigue strength is lower than expected, especially if we relate the fatigue strength to the very fine laminar microstructure that is obtained. Uh, the fatigue strength is slightly lower and uh, that can be related to the very small inherent porosity that is observed in the structure. On top of the picture, we see the microstructure with a fine laminar, laminar structure, microstructure of an asbel titanium 6 aluminum 4 vanadium from the laser based powder bed fusion. And on the right, we see the example of a topology optimized lightweight aerospace bracket um, using titanium 6 aluminum 4 vanadium. Another material that I would like to discuss is copper for metal additive manufacturing. Um, we would rate the technology readiness level as five, where it has been validated in the relevant environment. Um, in certain cases, uh, certain organizations have been able to process uh, the copper to a very satisfactory extent. But the typical alloys used are either pure copper or a copper chromium zirconium alloy. The additive manufacturing process being used is the laser based powder bed fusion. Uh, and a typical heat treatment, post build heat treatment is applied on the processes. Some of the processing challenges relate to a very low laser absorption. The high reflectivity of copper reflects most of the laser energy and a very low absorption is observed, and the very high thermal conductivity enables dissipation of the heat that has been converted from the absorbed laser energy. <coughs> this relates to uh, the need for very high intensity for completely melting the structure of the um, powder particles. We have been able to find relative densities ranging from 96 to 99 percent. The typical characteristics um, would be a static tensile strength of 210 MPa. Uh, in conventionally forged copper, you know, CUCRZR, uh, a 400 MPa tensile strength is observed. An electrical conductivity of 75 to 80 percent after post processing after the post build heat treatment is observed. On right, we see a application example of a 3D printed combustion chamber, which was developed by NASA. This is a copper alloy GRCO84. Um, also a polished cross section of a laser based powder bed fusion, copper chromium zirconium alloy. At the bottom, we see the example of uh, the powder particles, a, a scanning electron microscope image of the particles showing perfectly spherical copper particles that are being used. I'd like to briefly discuss the post-processing with regards to the material. Um, the, a standard post-processing of stress relieving is applied for laser-based powder bed fusion process. This is due to the very high thermal residual stresses that are induced in the part because of the high scanning speeds and the very high cooling rates that are applied. Therefore, a uh, stress relieving post bed heat treatment is essential. This also enables a reduction of anisotropy in the parts. 
precipitation hardening mechanisms are applied to materials such as stainless steel 17.4 pH, stainless steel 15.5 pH, and miraging steel 1.27 or 9. Um, this, these are typically performed before the part is detached from the base plate in order to prevent any deformation due to thermally induced stresses in the part. There is a very um, high focus on hot isostatic pressing, especially for aerospace and energy applications, where very good fatigue and creep uh, properties are required. The hipping process eliminates um, any micro cracks or pores in the part, and it reduces the anisotropy of the parts and enables an increase in ductility. Um, in the pictures on the top, we see the effect of hipping on the porosity of 3D printed titanium 6 aluminum 4 vanadium. A part, this, these parts have been micro CT scanned. Uh, pre treatment, pre hipping part, which shows a porosity of 0.05%, can be hipped to a porosity of 0%. Again, 0% based on the analysis technique, which is the micro CT. For material titanium 6 fold that might have a low density with a porosity of about 0.62%, there can also be a fully dense structure that is observed after hipping. Um, at the bottom, I typically show the variation of tensile properties and a typical increase in the elongation the hipping process um, that has been achieved. I would quickly like to discuss the alternate uh, metal additive manufacturing processes. There are a lot of new metal additive manufacturing processes that are coming. We could classify them as laser-based powder bed fusion, electron beam powder bed fusion, and some of the other processes that would be the binder jet technology, direct metal deposition, and the wider uh, wire fed uh, electron beam uh, deposition, energy deposition. Um, we've tried to give a brief relative comparison based on some of the most important aspects of the technology. Uh, the characterization techniques uh, that are used are typically characterization of the raw material which would be to characterize the flowability, the chemical composition, the shape, and the moisture content. These are the important parts. On the structural characterization, typically the relative density is quantified and the pore shape analysis to see whether we have spherical porosity related to a high energy deposition or incomplete fusion with a non-spherical irregular porosity is observed. On the mechanical characterization, typical tensile properties, hardness, and fatigue and creep properties are um, looked at. The new material development is typically an um, experimental process that is carried out. Um, the criteria used to qualify a material is basically high relative density, and the mechanical characteristics should match the conventional process there should be no evidence of cracking and this requires a good thermal stress management the process parameters are typically the infill parameters but based on the part design there are different thermal conditions on the downward and the upward faces therefore typically different sets of parameters need to be developed for each of the specific areas uh, there is a change in relative density typically with the change in scan speed and power and the overall energy volumetric energy deposition and with an increase in energy deposition we typically see fusion happening but a further increase might relate to uh, vaporization of the material and uh, spherical porosity that is being included some of the key challenges in the new material development is the fact that experiment, it is an experimental study, so it is very expensive and time consuming. And 
there is a big variation of thermal condition based on the path design as well. The material which are susceptible to hot packing are typically challenging like carbon tool steels, materials with poor weldability like aluminum rot alloys, and materials with low absorption of laser like copper alloys are considered challenging. Also, we typically need to use pre-alloyed powders as creating powder mixes sometimes has a challenge with homogeneity. Some of the future research domains include spatial distribution of mechanical characteristics in the parts, um, analytical solutions for process parameter development are being developed, and new material systems including ceramics, metal matrix composites, shape memory alloys, and amorphous materials are being researched on. Um, here's a quick list of the references that have been used in the presentation. Um, uh, Sankha, I would now request you to please place the survey questions for the audience. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I just want the first question. Uh, I would request everyone to kindly pitch in your votes and uh, given your answers uh, we'll be conducting two more uh, simultaneously i would request everyone uh, currently to please uh, give in your responses uh, sir we are currently uh, taking in responses you can uh, discuss about something while the poll runs okay um i would um, like to welcome our panelist Dr. Kumar, Dr. Banerjee, and Billy. Um, I hope you guys were um, able to hear the presentation, and I would love to know your views on the topic of materials for additive manufacturing. Um, if you could start with you, Dr. Kumar, could I please have your brief views on the topic of materials for additive manufacturing? Sure. Uh, it was a very nice presentation uh, uh, there uh, from uh, Objective Fidelity. So, good work on that. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, from uh, the uh, material uh, point of view for additive manufacturing, uh, my uh, experience and expertise uh, limited to metal additive manufacturing with the different additive manufacturing processes. So. From that perspective, I'll discuss what I think um, uh, might be useful to the audience. So like um, you mentioned uh, in your presentation, uh, there are two uh, different um, uh, um, regime of material development. So one is um, uh, something that um, uh, the alloy is currently uh, being used uh, and practiced uh, using different manufacturing processes like casting or uh, forging uh, a type of alloys. But now uh, people wanted to uh, manufacture components with um, complicated design. So they wanted to uh, make um, a feedstock out of that particular alloy. So when you uh, try to convert such alloys, uh, since the process changes, and uh, the process dynamics changes, so it may not be uh, fruitful uh, to uh, extract an alloy composition um, within uh, everywhere within the uh, window of uh, the specification of particular alloy, particular alloy. So we need to um, uh, optimize and uh, develop uh, the chemistry within the specification at the same time without um, sacrificing the properties. At the same time, we should be able to print our deposit in any of the LT manufacturing process. So this is relatively um, uh, not so ch uh, challenging uh, process, but when uh, compared to the development of new alike industries for LT manufacturing. So, so one of the reasons why people uh, try to generate uh, or develop new uh, alloys in energy manufacturing is because they want to achieve uh, better properties than whatever um, the current alloys offer, or uh, they, they're trying to uh, increase the printability or uh, printing efficiency. 
so they wanted to come out of the alive uh, current alive situation and try to develop so uh, during this process um, there are several challenges um, with respect to uh, the metallurgy and uh, the process the printability aspect and the property aspect at the same time um, we also have problem with qualifying the material for certain application so when it comes to uh, the implementation of additively manufactured components since we are trying to change the process um, so that is uh, an up uh, hill task and also if you're changing the material trying to come up um, trying to implement a new material uh, that is additional um, a burden that uh, somebody have to overcome so these are the practical challenges so so when when it comes to um, uh, qualification testing and characterization plays a major role so uh, so for qualification purposes uh, there is an enormous amount of testing and uh, characterization needs to be done uh, if uh, you are trying to implement a component for aerospace application so there are uh, particular uh, guidelines uh which need to be followed uh in order to uh, come up with the a basis value uh, b basis value um to uh, implement uh, a certain um uh, material that are developed uh, for the manufacture so this uh, there are uh, this is the same process for developing materials for any other uh, manufacturing process but when it uh, comes to additive manufacturing so Uh, the industry is relatively small uh, and the market base uh, for such a material could be small so um, the cost of uh, uh, testing and qualification can be uh, uh, very high compared to the uh, market size uh, for that particular alloy that is being developed that's the real challenge uh, right now so i'll stop here so if anything else Uh, needed to be discussed then uh, i'll take it through uh, the question yes yes we do have quite a bit of questions um, but now thank you for the introduction and your views um uh, next um, good morning dilip um dilip is the managing director of pre systems um dilip i would uh, like you to please um uh, give me your views on the materials and uh as a pioneer in polymer additive manufacturing technology uh, specifically to polymer materials if you could uh tell us about your opinions sure uh, so thanks for having me here uh, it was a good presentation a nice general overview with some uh, deep insights in uh, certain places where it made a lot of us to get into detail so it was quite good and i hope the audience also also liked it uh i think among the three panelists uh, i would be the least uh, you know technically sound to get into that kind of detail because i'm more on the business side so i can give you the point of view of an oem and how we see the world so in terms of um, on the, on the plastic side of the business i mean if we talk about only the plastic side of the business uh we are noticing a, a significant increase in interest in high performance applications so initially sla sls and also now a dlp uh they were initially thought of as prototyping applications as you know but over the mm-hmm. years uh, high performance of composites uh, heat heat resistant materials um, have have started to show up and uh, especially our team is doing has been doing some quite interesting stuff so the general trend is not looking at just uh, using these materials for prototyping but also uh, customers are now coming to us and asking since we have the freedom of design uh, why do we have to restrict ourselves to to actually manufacturing these parts uh, in the traditional way can you come up with materials that can also be produced you know that can be used for mass production of end use parts so just to give you one example uh, we have um, under the under under the dlp technology that we have which is basically a resin based technology um, mm-hmm. 
we now have have a material which has got hdt of 300 degrees centigrade in fact uh, yeah. we don't know what the hdt is because uh, the apparatus to test hdt uh, actually maxes out at 300 and even at 300 when we dip our part in in that bath of oil which is heated to 300 uh, the part stays stable so this you know such kind of a temp uh, such kind of materials now can open doors to different kind of applications in fact one of our application engineers in our san diego office came up with a very interesting uh, idea of actually doing soldering so we've just released a video of a 3d printed part and there are uh, metal pieces uh, lodged into it and he's actually using a soldering iron on the part and, mm -hmm. uh, and nothing's happening to the part and this is a production material so this has got a long-term uv stability so it can stay as a as a plastic part for as if it was injection molded part so many uh, companies are coming to us with all kinds of ideas there was another um, organization which wanted to make a, like a device completely using 3d printing and we helped them so the figure four was used so we used the med amber 10 material which is a that's a biocompatible material we use the pro black 10 which is like an, like an abs kind of a material then that that component had flexible parts which had rubber parts and it so happened that the entire gadget i mean except the electronics and the hardware like the nuts and bolts everything was 3d printed so there's no injection mold at all uh, for that product and the benefit they get is they can now uh, change the design at will if and since it's a new product things are going to change every day so every week and uh, they can now uh, just change change the design and they can print it there's no need to go and uh, cut a mold and wait for two weeks for the mold to show up and then start the production and uh, their inventory management is is like next to next to nothing in, in fact uh, one of the uh, there are a few parts which are on the figure four our dlp printer which are actually printed on the figure four itself and uh, we say why not we just need maybe a few thousand a year why do we need to go and actually make the mold out of it so so this is the kind of conversations we as an oem are having with customers now and of course there's a large need of for for the customers to uh, you know talk about the normal rapid prototyping kind of uh, kind of applications and there they ask us to have more flexible materials more more rigid materials and more this and that but the shift in conversation is clearly towards the production side in fact most of our r&d dollars now are being being spent uh, towards the towards the production side of the business instead of just the prototype mm -hmm. and engineering plastics engineering, plastic, engineering plastic, yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. on the metal side uh, yes i mean that is a so those those applications are quite established like you know like titanium implants uh, just 3D systems itself has printed more than a million titanium implants. So those are established applications. Uh, now, now it's also being used in aerospace and stuff like that. So, so, uh, but on the plastic side, uh, things are getting very interesting because, uh, just to give an example, you know, we, we have launched material for for the figure four called Jewel Master Grey. Now, Jewel Master Grey, why? Because it, we think we, as in 3D systems, thinks that one nice application for that particular material is very high quality jewelry master patterns okay uh, because this can print at 10 microns layer thickness and it's got a extremely good finish and you know lots of stuff but however that material also is a high temp material means that hdt is also 300 degrees centigrade also that material is biocompatible so it can be autoclaved it can go into human body so now look at the combination, although we call it dual master gray, because that is what we think that the industry can use it for. Uh, I'm pretty sure there'll be all kinds of customers looking at the data sheet and saying, oh, oh this is a very interesting material. Yes, of course I can print very fine at 10 microns, but you know, I can do these other things as well. Uh, some healthcare company will come and say, you know, we like to try this material for something that we never even thought about. In fact, that's how that's how materials uh, are created. Uh, so well, we, we have a range of uh, I mean, more than 130 materials in our portfolio across powders, plastics, resins, all kinds of stuff. 
and most of them have been uh, invented because one of our materials failed so we went to a customer and the customer gave us a file to do a benchmark whatever and then it failed and then we realized why because this was a complete non-standard kind of an application something that we hadn't thought about so then we look at the that application see if if there's some large large potential and then we go back into our team and say you know what this is something that we should look into so so most of the materials are not uh, coughed up by some some the product manager who is who is uh, staying you know secluded in an office most of the materials are mm-hmm. are are invented to solve real real world problems wherein our we or our competition failed so this is just to give you an overview of how how the material development kind of a kind of life cycle works in uh, in an oem mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. thank you dilip very interesting insights on the development side um next uh dr banerji um, i would like to um have your views as well uh, especially um in relationship to what dilip mentioned about the development at an oem it would be very interesting to you have your insights on the development from a academic and a research institute perspective as well um dr banerji please can we have your comments uh okay i hope you can hear me can you yes sir okay uh, okay very good oh, first of all thanks a lot for having me on this panel and uh, that was a nice overview presentation i have listed uh, here some of the issues uh, that we see as being related to additive manufacturing and and we can talk about each of these issues in detail if people are interested in asking questions but i mm-hmm. i just wanted to add uh, i guess two or three uh, points which which complement your presentation and and which the other panelists have uh, touched upon uh, one is that of course it's chemistry is not enough and and uh, material scientists uh, tend to see the thermal cycle uh, and and deformation imparted to the material as crucial to getting certain properties and uh, the point i want to emphasize is the additive manufacturing process introduces a thermal cycle uh, in essentially what is a casting and welding process which is completely different from the standard domain of knowledge uh, so those of you who are getting into this area of additive manufacturing need to understand that the, the standard processing structure property relationship domain that that you have relied upon in in common alloys like 64 and others are entirely not applicable to the additive manufacturing process and and therefore uh, as the first panelist pointed out uh, the importance of a complete characterization and the time and cost of that is is generally underestimated so that's that's uh, one broad uh, point that i wanted to add to your presentation Uh, the second is that uh, that given the importance of this thermal cycle uh, i think one also tends to choose a process and you just summarize the various processes but one tends to choose a process which which the material is comfortable with and and this often uh, balances against the complexity of the part and the surface finish that you need but in general difficult to weld materials materials that are that are uh, sensitive to hot cracking and so on uh, you do need slow cooling rates you need a large amount uh, significant substrate heating and and this is accomplished not by uh, the standard laser fusion laser slm process but you'd rather move towards a dmd process which gives you intrinsically slower cooling rates or an electron beam process which gives you substantially higher substrate or part heating capabilities so that you're actually melting on a very hot part uh, so 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 i think one needs to be aware that depending upon the material that you want the complexity of the shape that you want the surface finish that you want you really have to choose the right process for that purpose uh, the third aspect that i wanted to emphasize in relation to am Uh, in relation to mechanical behavior characterization 
is that since you're doing a net shaped part, and that is the idea of AM, that you end up with a net shaped part, it is often very difficult, if not impossible, to extract samples for mechanical behavior from such a part. Therefore, one relies on additional blocks of material being made with the same process in inverted commas uh, to, 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 and one hopes that the mechanical behavior on those samples are representative of the actual part, but need, this need not actually be so, because the local uh, thermal, uh, thermal history of, of the mechanical behavior part could be very different uh, from the local thermal history of the actual part. And, and therefore, uh, the, there's a substantial amount of understanding required in this, in this business of mechanical behavior characterization uh, that is often not recognized. I guess the last part that I want to emphasize is that residual stresses are generally ignored by, by the industry in India anyway, uh, simply because uh, measuring residual stresses is not easy. Uh, and, and often leads to widely varying results. But, but residual stresses are crucial to post heat treatment distortions. They're crucial to mechanical behavior. And, and uh, especially in critical applications such as aerospace applications, uh, this aspect of additive manufacturing is generally ignored by, by the Indian industry. So these are the very broad comments I had. Uh, uh, the more detailed comments are in this, in this slide. And, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, relating to any of these points down the line. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I, Sankar, I would uh, like to please have the poll results so that we can have a discussion on the poll results, please. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, just hold on, sir. I'll be sharing my screen. Yes, I think my screen is visible. Yes. So within the poll, the first question we had was what are the biggest drivers of selection of AM processes and materials um, for additive manufacturing? Uh, there were four options, material specifications, the commercial cost, delivery time, and fourth option is depending on the application. Um, and uh, we have almost 50% of the audience selecting depending on the application, but 30% audience looking at the material specifications. And in a way, to my surprise, the commercial cost are only 10% uh, are, are drivers for only 10% of the audience. Um, maybe we can have a discussion. Uh, Dilip, would you have any comments on this poll results? Uh, yes, uh, because the one of the main drivers for moving from uh, you know traditional manufacturing to uh, you know AM, I would expect at least more than ten percent for the commercial cost because that's a business driver. So, mm -hmm. but it may also represent uh, or give you a good idea of your audience. They may be more on the on the technology side. So this is something. Maybe if you had uh, uh, run the same poll uh, and only called, you know, the CTOs or I mean the CXOs, uh, the CEOs of the companies, then maybe they would give uh, the commercial cost a much higher rating. Uh, but yes, uh, depending on application. So that's that's a fair thing because. Not everything needs to be printed. Not everything can be printed. Not everything needs to be only 3D printed. So, like you can have a hybrid kind of a kind of an approach as well. So, you you can cast a part up to a point, and then you can you know 3D print other stuff on top of it. Or you can uh, I mean there are there are various options. So the application is is the key driver. Uh, but from the application, uh, the next thing immediately goes to is a commercial cost. So, so we we get a lot of inquiries. I mean, like 90% uh, of our, uh, a metal 3D printer leads that we get are for applications which just don't make sense in terms of 3D printing. Uh, to give an example, uh, I, I we I mean this is an extreme example. 
but I once got in a, a lead from a person who, who wanted to print uh, electricity poles using a metal printer. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't blame them because the, the, the news in the media and the way the media makes it sound is that you, know, you can print everything now. Mm -hmm. Now the media tries to sell the idea that, you know, in the future, everything actually will be 3D printed. So mm -hmm. uh, we need to filter out uh, the, the noise from the signal. And uh, a lot of our time goes in explaining to these customers or these prospects why we can't do their job. And, and we think it's a, a good thing to do because if, if, I mean, if you just ignore them and not give a, a proper reasoning, the, the, we won't really, uh, you know, uh, solve solve the solve the confusion in their mind. So we do, as a company, uh, spend a lot of time educating people on what can be printed, what should be printed, what should not be printed. So yes, just my thoughts on the first uh, on the first question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Dr. Kumar, Dr. Banerjee. Anything that you would like to add? Yeah, sure. Um, which, uh, like like Dilip, Dilip was mentioning, uh, from the tech, uh, technical uh, point of view, obviously, uh, uh, so the person who wants to um, achieve uh, something that is not uh, uh, being uh, done currently uh, uh, won't uh, uh, consider the cost of this alloy, right? So the such a, uh, people are expected to be highly technical. Uh, so when it comes to a uh, commercial side of it, so I agree with uh, what uh, Dilip is saying. Uh, but um, when it comes to uh, applications uh, in aerospace and all, so the performance uh, matters uh, the most, and also the trade-off uh, that we can get uh, by using additive manufacturing in terms of uh, performance. Uh, uh, that uh, trade-off. Uh, is highly um, inclined towards getting better properties and uh, better performance. So that can be uh, easily uh, justified for the increased cost. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, my perception at this time, and, and this may change down the line, is that you're primarily driven uh, for aerospace, and I'm talking about aerospace and critical applications, yeah. you're primarily uh, driven by the capability of producing uh, hybrid parts. You're driven by the ability of repair, which is extremely important in the aerospace and other gas land-based turbines and so on. And you're uh, driven by the fact that uh, uh, you can change shape fairly simply in, in, a, in a situation where design requires you to explore different shapes for a given material. Uh, I think costs are extremely important, whatever industry you're in. I, mm -hmm. And ultimately, uh, an application will depend on the cost provided you meet all other requirements. I, I think you're very far away from, uh, so, so, so shape complexity and, and these things are far more important uh, then improving performance at this time. Mm -hmm. I think you're primarily trying to meet existing performance parameters uh, in more complex shapes or in the case of repair or in the case of uh, reduction in the number of parts that you're making through hybrid processes. I think these are the drivers and not performance at this time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, I would like to quickly move to the second question, which is more specific to polymer additive manufacturing. And we asked our audience that in the case of polymers, how do you compare properties of additively manufactured parts to replace conventionally manufactured parts? And um, rightly so, 41% uh, said it depends on the specifications. But next, we had 28% which strongly agree with the fact that polymer additively manufactured parts can replace conventionally manufactured parts. Uh, and 25% agree. So overall, a very positive opinion. And um, again, I, I am slightly surprised, Dilip, because looking at the size of conventional 
polymer uh, industry, the additive still plays a very small part in my opinion. And although we have a lot of new developments, which are definitely going to replace, I wanted your opinion on what is the current stage and uh, how well do you agree with the poll results? Yeah, so I, I kind of agree. And, uh, you know, this this is, needs to be like broken up into uh, two parts. One is the resin world and one is the powder world. So let me talk about the powder world first. Okay, so let's talk about SLS. So uh, SLS normally yields you end use parts. And the properties that you get from an SLS part are, are, are almost always equal to or maybe sometimes even better than uh, than the traditional used ones because now you can put you can put additives you can do all kinds of stuff i mean you can make things very rigid we have got a material called bluestone this is used in wind the tunnel the testing by mm -hmm. by the f1 teams uh, mm -hmm. those parts go through extreme force i mean really really extreme force uh, we have got uh, so so on the on the on the sls side uh, you can say that the parts that are that are printed uh, are almost as good or as good or sometimes even better than the traditional made ones the problem with that uh, mass adoption as a as a manufacturing technology is time so it is very time so sls is is a very time consuming process so it takes mm -hmm. you know 18 hours or 12 hours to build and then you have to cool it for the same amount of time, you know, and the, and the, and the throughput that you get, it it really doesn't justify large scale adoption. Uh, so that's why it has not been uh, there's not a big uptick in the adoption on the SLS side of the business. Okay, now let's talk about the now let's talk about the resin side. Uh, and the resin side, you have got SLA, which is basically a laser on top that is curing the top uh, top surface. And you've got uh, you've got DLP, which is which is again a resin, but uh, a light source, UV light source, cues it from the bottom. Uh, mm -hmm. There, the thing that you have to understand is uh, these materials are uh, very good. Some of them are you know really really superior ones. Uh, very tough, very rigid, very flexible. I mean, the very whatever kind of property that you want. However these are these are these are cured by by uv light so when they come out of the printer and they're post cured what about they, they all look good and they all work fine the problem is long-term uv stability so while they're very good for prototyping but look at the same part after a month look at the same part after six months uh, most probably you'll find that it is disfigured it is discolored it has maybe become a brittle maybe it is cracked that is that is because when while it is exposed to uv light from the sun ambient uv light it starts to bake inside i mean it starts to change internally so that is why sla has been a very nice technology for prototyping but hasn't lent itself well on the production side however having said that now the game is changing and i can give you examples of what we are doing as a company itself on on the dlp side of the business we actually have got a range of what we call as production materials. So these are mm -hmm. materials which can be used to make end use parts for life. And like I said in my earlier earlier response, some of the parts on this print of the figure four are printed on the figure four itself. It means that that those parts are going to live on the figure four until I don't know for, for X amount of years uh, until the printer is working so the change has started to come about now and what you're seeing now is companies coming to us saying okay you have these uh, production materials right so let us see if we can completely 3d print some parts now and i give you the example in my living of a of a complete the device which was completely 3d printed so so the conversation about whether the 3d printed parts are as good as uh, the traditionally uh, made parts that you have to qualify with end use if it's only for prototyping then the answer on on both sides is yes okay uh, why because we, we we make abs like kind of material 
when mm-hmm. we say ABS like, it means it's not actually ABS, but it's got all the properties of ABS. So our chemists have 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 worked in the lab to to come up with some kind of a formula where while uh, while it is printed and after it's printed, you get a proper ABS like kind of a uh, uh, like of properties. But the real uh, adoption and when you talk about additive manufacturing is on the long term use of these parts. So while the, mm-hmm. while the parts are good enough right now and they are perfectly all right, but if you look at it from a production kind of workflow, that's when your opinions will change. The long term stability and how long it will take to manufacture these parts on the SLS side, these are the, these these are the factors that will govern your decision whether you want to adopt additive manufacturing as a prototyping application or as a prototyping and a production application. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting insight. Um, for the third question, um, Dr. Banerjee, I would like your opinion. And uh, we had another, uh, we had a couple of questions from our audience that I would like to relate to this. So, uh, firstly, we asked our audience what industries will drive, will be key drivers for new material development. And 54% said aerospace, and 28% said medical. And then we also had a question uh, specifically for you, which uh, basically said, what are the typical material limitations for additively manufactured parts that limits its use for critical aerospace application? So um, I think both the uh, questions are quite related, the poll question and what we had for you. So maybe you could give your insight uh, on both together. Okay, I uh, yeah, I mean, people generally perceive the aerospace industry as driving new materials development because uh, because of the availability of funding to do so. But I think it's important to understand that the aerospace industry, and I'm I'm talking more about the aircraft industry, I guess, rather than let's say uh, space industry. The aircraft industry is extremely conservative. And f- forget about additive. If you look at new materials that have gone into aircraft applications over the last decade or more, you can count these on one finger of your hand. And and, and there is a good reason for that. And and that is and and we'll come and and that we'll address in relation to the second question. Uh, that is that uh, certification costs, retooling costs. Uh, and so on uh, are often extremely prohibitive in in uh, in employing new materials in any part of of an aircraft okay so i still don't see the aerospace industry as driving new materials development i do see it as driving the additive manufacturing process uh, in in a situation where the commercial and the cost and the time analysis which have been listed in the first point indicate that the am process is a is going to be a attractive process from all these aspects and and therefore we must adopt an am process of existing alloys Uh, this is how i see the situation at this time Uh, you you might also want to just do a quick survey of uh, what people are working on in academics and additive manufacturing and you will you will again find something like less than 0.5 percent of people working on new materials for additive manufacturing and that is because the drivers are different okay there's, there's more than enough to do in understanding the process differences and 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 other important requirements for the aerospace industry than worrying about new chemistries altogether. Uh, so this is one comment that I had in relation to item three. And and Dilip might or might not agree, I don't know, but this is my perception, yeah. Can uh, I add uh, one point? Yeah, yeah, sure. It's, yeah. Uh, so when it comes to new material development, uh, so uh, there are two uh, aspects, right? So one is completely new material for the in- entire material uh, the spectrum. Uh, so uh, sometimes when uh, new material is referred in additive manufacturing, it's already an existing alloy trying to convert into additive manufacturing feedstock. 
So that is a little bit different. Uh, probably could address too. So, for example, yeah. so some of the um, high temperature allies like um, uh, like uh, three uh, um, nine nine three nine or seven thirty eight, uh, uh, the internal families are already existing allies. They are um, uh, um, not. Uh, they are prone to cracking when it is printed. So now people are trying to develop those materials. So that also falls in new material category within additive manufacturing. So. Okay. So if you look at the existing catalog of materials for AM, the new materials that would be developed for AM are most likely to be from the aerospace. And they could be the existing materials for the aerospace industry, but they would still be the new materials for the additive manufacturing sector in a way. Is that what you're saying? You have to define new materials very carefully. I mean, as, as Dilip <laughs> said, if you're talking about a material where you're tweaking the specification, existing chemistry specification uh, slightly or, re, or, or more tightly within those to suit an AM process, that's one kind of material. But an entirely new composition, that is, that is what I thought of as a new material. Okay. And, and to me, that's that's a long way away. Yeah, yeah. But coming to what you meant, uh, prohibitory cost of the characterization. I think even for an existing material to just qualify it with an AM process, still the cost is so high that that might be a restrictive uh, process as well. Yes, so, and and this depends really on the criticality of the part, and and there are rigorous definitions of criticality. Uh, that you apply. I mean, uh, a part could be, uh, if if I can have the other slide, a part could be mission critical. It could be uh, uh, related to criticality in sense of flight safety in man-rated vehicles, or it could be non-critical. And therefore, the costs of qualification will vary significantly depending upon whether it's flight safety critical, mission critical, or non-critical. So that's the first mm -hmm. first uh, thing one must understand. And therefore, the first input of AM processes, where it is uh, attractive from other considerations, is to is to look at the non-critical parts. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the, when you look at flight safety and mission critical parts, uh, uh, what I pointed out initially is that the process in terms of its uh, thermal history is so different from conventional processes that you need to establish an entirely different structure property, process structure property relationship uh, for an existing chemistry. And, and that itself is, is a time consuming process and over that, you have to lay the significant, statistically significant property database that you have to generate for flight safety and mission critical applications. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, those of you who are embarking on flight safety and mission critical applications have to be extremely careful about understanding the cost and time issues related to qualification. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to... Uh... Add, uh, Mr. Banerjee. Please, um, please. So yes, I I wholeheartedly agree with what you're saying, and I'll go a step further. So let me give you an example. Okay, now here we are talking about making new materials, right? So let let me give an example of of a conversation I had with uh, with an aerospace customer. So basically, they are a MRO company, and they have to. Uh, so they were they are thinking of using AM as a process to, to uh, you know, manufacture parts for existing aircraft. Now, uh, we have the right material for them already. There's no need to make anything new. We have the right process, so we have the right printer. Uh, we, have the, we have printed the right part. We've done the testing. Everything is done. So there's, there's really nothing more that is, that is required here. However, uh, just the act of getting this part certified using the existing material, okay? Just the act of getting this part certified is so large and so big that uh, they drop the plan. And here we are talking about inventing a new material altogether and trying a new application mm -hmm. altogether. So, so just just to uh, highlight what uh, what Mr. Banerjee was saying, 
Yes, it's a very steep slope. Aerospace does seem to be the golden boy 1A because uh, it checks the box of low quality, uh, low quantity. Okay, it checks the box of uh, shape optimization. You know, so it checks all the right boxes. But the once you start working on redesigning in uh, redesigning in uh, uh, aerospace part and trying to get the right material or changing something on the you are, you are looking easily at eight to ten years from when that part is going to actually fly. And I'm talking about critical parts here, not and, and, parts. and, and I'm glad I, I'm glad you said eight to ten years. I was going to put out that time frame myself. So yeah, it totally. <laughs> no, no, it's true, it's true. We have customers who are who are. Who are on this journey so yeah. it is going to so but the thing is after you spend eight to ten years and you get that entire thing qualified then it is something that won't change for the next 20 years that's how the aerospace industry works so it's a very yes. long game long play that these companies are, are getting themselves into and they understand it so it's a big investment so much so that while we embarked with these companies on this journey we have to ensure we have to give an undertaking that those printers that that they're using right now to print and to test will stay for 25 years meaning even if we launch a new model of it and launch a second version third version fourth fifth and launch brilliant new materials okay we will still have to manufacture for them that very old printer which is like 20 years old now Let's take for example we have reached say 2050 uh, or 2040 okay the the printer that they that they have been working on in 2020 will still be manufactured maintained the software still will have to work so that's how long of a time frame we are looking when we talk about uh, am in aerospace and uh, space and so the if you look at the levels of difficulty of say adoption the easiest is defense you you can print all kinds of metal parts and put it on a uh, on a missile or uh, on on a chopper or or a, or a also also jet fighter because they they have a very low like a kind of a threshold next comes uh, uh, stuff like private jets okay wherein the number of souls on board are are less high value but less i mean every soul has got a value the worst absolute worst is the commercial aviation for that you will need eight to ten years and then after that you have a set business but it's uh, something that you need to keep in mind so so it's long answer to a simple question but although um, the aerospace sounds very lucrative and it is but it's a very long game mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to add uh, i wanted to add about uh, some peculiarities of the indian context uh, one is that one is a raw material uh, sustaining quality powder, the same quality powder from sources which are limited and, and essentially abroad at this point in time is a very serious issue. Mm -hmm. and, and we have Indian manufacturers of powder only located today in the, in, the, in the major metallurgical labs. There is ARC in Hyderabad, Defense Metallurgical Research Lab in Hyderabad, and one other, probably uh, VSSC, who are gas atomizing powder. And, and so this is something that, that the commercial AM guy must look at uh, in terms of uh, powder supply uh, in the long term. <laughs> The second is that, uh, by and large, this is not true for the space research organization, but if you're looking at the aviation industry in India, it is essentially a military industry, and it's essentially HL, and they are not the uh, OEMs, and they don't have knowledge of the design database that was actually used in, in, in applying things for fairly critical applications. Now, when you try to replace something uh, with a new process and you generate a new design, statistical design database, you're then faced with the problem of understanding whether this new database that you're generating is within the statistical database that was used in the design of the material. And you don't have that knowledge because you don't, you're, not, you're not supplying the OEM. And, and, and that's, that's a critical issue. 
and we've struggled with this. I, I out of DRDO, we've struggled with this, uh, and so I'm just passing this on. No, very interesting. So, I hope that changes. Uh, so yeah. if I could add a little bit more insight on the on the powder side, yes, uh, Mr. Banerjee is absolutely right. So one little bit of information about the powder side of the business, which not many people know. Yeah. Uh, the commercial manufacturers of powder, uh, you, sh you have to realize that the powder which is used for metal AM is actually a byproduct. So the vast majority of the powder which they atomize is not for AM. It is actually for other applications like paints and this smaller size of grain size and distribution is something that doesn't work for for the other applications so earlier this this kind of powder used to go to waste almost or they had to find some other kind of use then as metal am started to come about these guys these these companies started to find okay there's some use also of it so so if you go to see the, the there are no very large supplies of metal powder which are using am as a focus kind of an organization uh, like a focus vertical what this means is if their processes change something happens they they may they they may not be able or maybe or they may not be interested to supply the am industry the kind of powder and the quantities and the distributions and stuff that they want so these are all variables which you to which we as oems also have to factor in when we think about long term uh, you know so when we ship a powder or when we make the parameters for a powder uh, it normally takes us nine months on an average okay so i mean there's a huge kind of a testing that goes on and it takes nine months uh, just to give an idea say, say if you are uh, maybe a lab like drdo okay and your application is known to you and you know what you want to do and so you you start with the powder and you test a few things and that works for you. Uh, but if you are someone like a 3D systems or an EOS, you have to look at, you know, war, where all this powder is going to be used in how many applications all around the world. So it's like, uh, you know, uh, and and uh, take, take uh, for example, Apple and an app developer. An app developer can come up with new versions of their app soon because they just do make make a few changes and test and they can come up with a new app altogether i mean that that is soon but for apple to release an update to their ios i mean just one small change one pixel moving here and there one like button moving here and there they it, it, it takes them a very 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 long time because they they have to because that is going to affect each and every iphone and ipad and and in you know, i like whatever on the whole planet so we we have to go through a much more rigorous kind of a testing cycle and a, and a, uh, and the characterization kind of a cycle then then individual players who want to do stuff on their own uh, so mm -hmm. while i'm saying this you know material is a big variable as well so we have to ensure that we we will be able to get this kind of quality uh, from a supplier so these are things that to also keep in mind yes i i completely agree with mr banerjee um, thank you very much. Uh, there's, uh, I think one item that I wanted to add, if if there is time. Yes, yes, please, sir. Uh, and 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 that is that I think, uh, and I'm fairly familiar with the metal additive industry, and and I think the metal additive industry is not paying at enough in, uh, attention to process control. Uh, this includes reuse of powder, that is one part, and the things that can happen when you reuse powder. But the other part is you must be able to reproduce your process over the entire powder bed time and time again in terms of the thermal uh, history that, that this part is undergoing. And therefore, you need sensors that are measuring location-specific temperature profiles and other aspects uh, which have to be incorporated if again you're looking at the aerospace industry uh, if if you're making small nuts and bolts it doesn't matter but if you're looking at the aerospace industry uh, sense in, that is my point seven sense integration and supporting computational techniques into am processing uh, to maintain constancy of the spatiothermal a spatial temporal thermal industry history is extremely critical and you have to invest in that if you want to be a serious player in the 
in the aerospace business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we are about uh, near the end. Uh, Dr. Kumar, I would like to ask you one last question. Um, could you, we've touched a lot on the post-processing, so could you discuss a bit on the post-processing methodologies that would enable a high fatigue and creep characteristics for metal laying parts? Sure. Uh, yeah, so as far as uh, post-processing um, is concerned, um, like what Brigu has mentioned in his, in his presentation is like, uh, so in order to uh, remove the porosities we hip, and then uh, in order to uh, get the right microstructure, so we do a uh, certain uh, heat treatment, either um, uh, solutionizing, uh, uh, just solutionizing and, uh, or annealing, or um, so in some cases we do solutionizing and aging. So particularly if you want to uh, get certain properties, so the properties uh, are um, manifested uh, based on the microstructural uh, condition and the chemistry, right? So when it comes to material properties. So it, it's when it comes to AAM uh, materials, it is a little bit different than conventionally manufactured material. The material is, uh, is not um, having the uniform microstructure. It has, um, uh, uh, the microstructure develops based on uh, the cooling rate. So the cooling rate, um, uh, uh, um, basically the cooling rate, not only the cooling rate, uh, um, and also uh, the, uh, the solidification structure. So wherever the thickness um, uh, changes or the cross-section area changes, the, uh, the thermal condition uh, can be different. So uh, due to which uh, the microstructure within the part is heterogeneous. So one has to uh, look into it. So when uh, you're designing your heat treatment or post-processing, so we'll have to find uh, an optimal um, uh, the heat treatment cycle. So this heat treatment cycle may not be um, uh, the uh, current, um, the ASTM specified cycle or any other standard um, heat treatment cycle which are mentioned in the uh, handbook. So particularly if you want to um, get a uh, high creep resistant uh, material. So try uh, to avoid the phases that are um, uh, deleterious uh, to the high temperature properties and try uh, not to generate um, at the grain boundary uh, carbide, try to minimize it. At, at the same time, so you need to have a certain uh, size and distribution of a uh, certain type of carbide uh, within the matrix uh, uniformly distributed. So. So these kind of things uh, provide um, uh, the challenging uh, to AM material uh, because uh, the microstructure is heterogeneous. You're trying to optimize uh, the microstructure in one location uh, that uh, may not be uh, replicated all over the place. So the ideal um, uh, uh, situation in this case is uh, try to find where the critical um, location of uh, the component is try to uh, optimize um, the microstructure wherever uh, it matters the most. So. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, thank you very much. I think it's been a very interesting discussion. Um, I would, uh, we, are, we are just about to end in the next couple of minutes. So I would like to quickly just um, introduce our next last session. Um, which would be held next week, 6th August. Uh, this would be the aerospace, space, and defense applications for additive manufacturing. And we would have the panelist as uh, Mr. Govind Bajargan uh, from the SSC, Mr. Prakasa Manam from EOS Indian Office, and Mr. Donald Godfrey, Senior Fellow from SLM Solutions. Um, with this, I would like to really thank our panelists uh, for the informative session and the good discussion and any closing remarks from the panelists, uh, I would welcome. Uh, so Dilip, uh, if you have any closing remarks, quick closing remarks, um, I would really appreciate that. Uh, not much. I mean, I think I spoke enough, but uh, thanks for having me. And I think so. It, uh, it was, I mean, it's nice to have webinars like this way, which can 
uh, you know, um, get different kinds of thoughts in the same room and uh, sometimes opposing thoughts as well. And uh, because this is a field that not many people know about and there's a lot of misinformation as well. Uh, so events like this uh, help. Uh, I mean, events like this will make my life easier. Actually, we go to see. <laughs> so Thank you. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Banerjee, uh, could I have your closing remarks, please? No. Well, well, thank you very much for having me participate. I think I've really said all that I wanted to say, so I'll leave it to the others. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Kumar, um, your closing remarks, please. Uh, thanks for having me uh, here. Uh, and also, I uh, still uh, believe uh, that um, the LED manufacturing uh, is the lowest hanging fruit for uh, new material development. So even though uh, it has um, uh, industry specific um, uh, 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 barriers, uh, but um, if not, uh, so in uh, additive manufacturing, so in any other uh, developing new materials and any other technology is going to be even more um, you know, tougher. So I think so there is enormous um, uh, advantage we have in additive manufacturing in terms of uh, testing small quantity of materials and so on. So uh, with that, uh, I thank and also I, uh, I, in, uh, I learned a lot from uh, Dr. Banerjee and uh, Dilip's uh, comments as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is me signing out, Vrigo Ahuja, CTO of Objective Eye Technologies. Do attend our next session on the 6th of August. Um, we do hope we have a very informative session next week. Um, over to you, Ankit Sahu. Thank you, Bragu. Thank you for everyone. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee. Uh, thank you, Dilip. Thank you, doc, uh, Dr. Kumar. Uh, it has been a great pleasure hosting you guys and great insights today. And uh, I really look forward how we can work together and uh, we can take this further. And thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. I think I have answered most of the questions. Uh, otherwise, like you have our email IDs, you can just shoot out an email. Uh, if it is needed, uh, it will be answered by the panelist itself. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sankar. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. <clears throat> bye thank bye. you bye and bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.